They drew first blood, not me. Look, Johnny. Let me come in and get you the hell out of there. They drew first blood. Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. The right take on entertainment. The hit cast offers a weekly look at Hollywood from a conservative point of view. Sick of media bias infecting Hollywood headlines? Tired of stars insulting your views? Hit has your back. Now, here's your host, Christian Toto. Welcome to episode 135 of the Hollywood and Toto podcast, The Right Take on Entertainment. This week we're talking with artist John Rivoli from the Rivoli Design Group. You may not know his name, but chances are you've seen John's movie-related artwork at department stores, bus stops, and probably just about everywhere. I have a personal connection to John, one that goes back more than two decades to my art school days. I think you're going to like this story. Well, the Joker is playing in theaters right now, and the conversation around the film has been, well, kind of crazy. The big story for a while was how the movie would spark real-world violence, as if we needed to censor films that we suspect, just suspect, of having just that impact. This comes after Hollywood insisted for years and years that ultra-violent, gun-related movies can never, ever, ever be blamed for actual violence. Now, some critics are calling out the film for its problematic race casting. Really, I'm not making this up. This week, listen to the Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast, as woke as any show of its kind. The recent episode broke down that people of color were mistreated in the movie. Spoiler alert, people of all shades are cruel to Arthur Fleck, the man who becomes the Joker. One scene in particular features a bunch of brown kids beating Arthur up on the streets of Gotham City. Well, Arthur lives in a Big Apple-style scenario, and it's a melting pot, just like the real Manhattan. So he's bound to run to bad people of all colors, white, black, brown, you name it. And, spoiler alert, he does. Well, so what? Aren't we supposed to integrate movie casts? Isn't it progress to have people of color in roles large, medium, and small? Well, yes, and then no. You can never, ever win with social justice warriors. We should have learned that lesson already. Oh, and by the way, Arthur has a huge crush on a black woman who lives in his building. She's seen as beautiful, kind, and a good single mother. Not good enough, am I right? All the above drove the New Yorker critic into a frenzy. Now, you have to read the entire thing. It's, it's almost like a parody. But here's just one little paragraph to kind of wet your whistle. Joker is an intensely racialized movie, a drama awash in racial iconography that is so prevalent in the film, so provocative, and so unexamined as to be bewildering. Well, what does this critic think of Joker? It's my best movie of the year so far. I know we've got a few months left, but far and away better than anything I've seen in 2019. Now, feel free to disagree with that. That's how it should be. But if you're a film critic, how about reviewing the movie in question and leave all your personal baggage to your blog or Facebook page or something like that? What do you say? And now here's the hit tweet of the week. This week's winner is comedian Michael Ian Black. Michael usually spends his Twitter time calling out the NRA as a terrorist organization. This time, though, he stubs his toe in a hard truth. Here's his quote. Seems like Trump is totally effed, which I guess means nothing will happen to him. Well, Michael, maybe nothing will happen to him because he did nothing wrong. You gotta detox from all that fake news. You're listening to the Hollywood in Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. This week, I wanted to introduce a fascinating writer to the hit cast. Anne Bridges is a right-leaning author, but that hardly tells the whole story. She's an in-demand speaker, a frequent radio show guest, and an author who bounces from fiction to nonfiction books. Her novel, Rare Metal, explores China's stranglehold on rare earth metals and what it means to all of us. It's kind of what she does best, bring real-world situations into the fictional landscape, leaving us entertained and enlightened. Not a bad combination. I hope you enjoy my chat with author Ann Bridges. 
Well, and you're one of those writers who pivots from fiction to nonfiction. You both do what you do both well. I'm just kind of curious when you're making those changes, when you're tackling a project one day and maybe something else the next, it, what's the motivation? Is it something that inspires you that you think would be the best, the best way to approach it would be from the nonfiction route? I'm just kind of curious what's your, what your guiding element is when you're sitting down to write. I always go gut check to what was my motivation for writing. And frankly, it was way back years ago when I said I wanted to help voters understand the issues because in California, um, my taxes were always going up because voters raised taxes on me. And so I chose the theme of freedom and fairness and tried to explain that in terms that are relevant uh, to today's conversations mm -hmm. through both fiction and nonfiction. Is it hard to kind of switch gears like that, or do you quickly get in a different, I guess, mind space or head space when you're, when you're sitting down to write? Because of my business background, I probably naturally gravitate more towards uh, nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, so fiction is a challenge. I really have to block out a space of time, get my mind wrapped around the characters and what point of view um, they're coming from. Uh, I tend to write with uh, multiple points of view. So some people will write, for example, first person. So it's all from a single single person's perspective telling their, their story. Um, I like being able to show different people's and different characters perspective of the exact same incident mm -hmm. as a way to bring some open-mindedness and critical thinking to the elements of our life that we see every day through our eyes and maybe are unaware that someone else might have a different yeah. <laughs> conclusion do you have any quirky writing habits where maybe the lights are low or you're right in the earliest morning hours or anything like that um, I use a spreadsheet to organize, which a lot of people are very surprised because typically writers are language oriented and not, you know, numbers oriented. But I'm very comfortable using a spreadsheet and I find it it's a way to organize what I'm doing. So I'll have each chapter broken into different scenes and then each character has different characteristics. And so each each paragraph that I'm writing, I'm trying to accomplish a certain goal. And it's just a great way to organize the entire book in one big screen uh, in front of me. I have a big screen, thankfully, <laughs> so I can look at that and then have my word processing document open and just be using the two tools at the same time. Interesting. And I, I like that. I mean, it's very organized. I think a lot of writers want to be as organized as that, but often they don't achieve it. But uh, I, wonder, I think that you've written a lot of different things, and I, I want to focus specifically on one book. So I think it maybe it captures best what you do, bringing some real-world information into a novel setting and it's rare metal and i thought you'd be the best person to describe what the story is about and how you do incorporate your experience into a storytelling format okay so my first novel private offerings was really a reflection of my experiences in silicon valley and i was tossing around trying to find kind of what i could do as a sequel and one of the major events which is now being talked about candidly which is china China's role and dominance in our manufacturing and our reliance on them for uh, finished goods, which start with rare earths, which are what make your smartphone bright red and all the miniature batteries and mobility that we've come to rely on. We're in essence 100% dependent on China for many of the minerals that are part of that processing. Anyway, long story short, in 2013, no one in Silicon Valley was talking about it. And I realized two things were happening. One, they didn't want to acknowledge the reality um, or they wanted to keep their heads in the sand because of all the stock options and the financial impact. Right. You know, if you dare question anything, all of a sudden your personal wealth goes down. So I created a character, kind of a Steve Jobs like uh, person who has very candidly outsourced all the manufacturing and said, hey, that's okay, I've got my Tesla, I'm at the top of the world. That's how it starts. And what we have is a, a what-if scenario of if what happens if China cuts off all of the imports to the United States. And it started just as a Silicon Valley-focused um, novel, but in the course of it, I started wanting to have endorsements um, from people. And I ran into one guy who very much was familiar with the industry, but brought in the whole national security issue that in essence, we cannot go to war without China's permission because China manufactures our Jeeps and our bullets and our uh, all of our advanced weaponry right now. 
And it, to me, that was startling. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. So um, I brought that element in, literally slashed a third of the novel out, um, and it brought in the, the national security issue. And that really resonated with people. Um, it broadened my audience into the um, politi- politics, much more than just the business, into the Washington, D.C., Area and actually segued me then into uh, meeting my co-author for the nonfiction book Groundbreaking because he wanted to talk about the same issue in layman's terms. He's an academic and a scholar and a geologist, and he was very concerned that it would come off as a white paper as, or as a college textbook. And instead, he wanted to have something that would explain in clear terms how we got to where we are and kind of what some of the solutions are going forward in terms of mining again in the United States. So that was that collaboration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was a great kind of divergent where you can kind of take it from a novel point of view, put it in narrative form, then also switch gears and, and tell a story in a more straightforward fashion. Really cool. Uh, you know, I, I think what you do is what a lot of conservatives ask me. How do we fight, you know, back in pop culture? How do we engage in the culture wars? You know, Hollywood has all this messaging. What do we do? And obviously you're doing just that. But from your perspective, for people who maybe can't write as well as you can or just don't have that skill set, what can we do? I mean, what, what's your advice for conservatives who are worried that the Hollywood messing machine is so comprehensive? It, you know, and not just Hollywood. It's publishing. It's music. How do we fight back? What do you, what's your best answer there? Well, I think a lot of conservatives have fallen victim – to themselves uh, in this concept of self-censorship. We shut ourselves up. We we realize that our, our opinions are unpopular. Trust me, I'm a conservative woman in Silicon Valley, okay? I am like 5% of the, the audience here. So um, <laughs> and uh, the trick, I think, is to share what you enjoy with people at a minimum you trust um, and hopefully start introducing these concepts to people that maybe are open-minded or explain why you enjoyed my novel or why you read a nonfiction book that talked about how, you know, you, the smartphone that we're all addicted to really does either use child labor from Africa or we should start mining it ourselves with strong labor laws and environmental laws. You know, start being provocative on issues that are relevant, but use the tools that you enjoy, whether it's music or comedy or uh, podcasts or Hollywood movies, to explain why you enjoy them and how you are benefiting from them. Because I think those conversations have just been muzzled. People say, oh, it's a personal choice, and you know they quietly enjoy it. They don't write reviews. They don't talk about it. And that is something that readers and consumers of the conservative culture can do to really help artists get more of a toehold. Interesting. I like that answer. Also, by the way, one of the things that I often recommend, and it's funny because one of the stars of the film is a very, very progressive fellow, James Cromwell. It's a movie called Still Mine. It came out, gosh, about five or so years ago, and it really does look at the red tape that interferes with our lives. It's a story about an older couple. He wants to build a home for his ailing wife, but of course the local government won't let that happen so easily. So you never know where you'll get stories. Now, I mean, you can go straight to the source like you and your books, and you're someone who's right of center bringing that message to the world. But you can also find it elsewhere. I mean, Hollywood sometimes accidentally puts out product that really supports our worldview as well. So good points there. Uh, Another thing I want to touch on real briefly is conservative authors, I speak to them often, and they say, boy, I attempted to go the traditional publishing route and that was a disaster. They wouldn't look at me. They wouldn't hear me. Their, their biases are very obvious. So that leads to both Amazon and self-publishing. Any thoughts on that space? Is it as helpful as we think? Are there, are there sort of maybe tricks to the trade that you can recommend there? Well, bottom line, I think what most writers really are disconcerted by is it truly is a business. Um, and so if you accept that, you you have choices. Your choice is I'm going to write what people want to consume, um, which means if you have a really conservative point of view, then you better find a way to find readers who want to read that. Now, a lot of um, people use nonfiction memoirs because then they can get in front of groups, fundraisers, etc., and sell books directly to the readers, cut out the middleman, you make a little bit more profit that way. Others go through churches, um, and just two you know, raw examples. Uh-huh. The problem the problem with Amazon um, 
if you're a more of an artistic writer or you want to write what you want to write no matter what, is that they are going to promote the books that sell. Um, they are agnostic as far as that is concerned. And the publishing industry reflects that as well. The concept of having a local retail in your conservative ho hometown that's going to stock books um, that sell is unrealistic because that book – retailer has to make money too. And uh, you, unless you are an established uh, known commodity, people are very reluctant to take a risk on you. Mm -hmm. And we're going back to um, a problem that actually started in the early 60s, where they started categorizing books. And it, there is no book category called conservative fiction. <laughs> OK, um, there is conservative commentary, I think, political commentary. But if you go onto Amazon these days, for example, and you just look at the list of fiction sections, you'll find ethnic and LGBT and women's lit and chick flicks. But just try to find something that's just conservative. There isn't one. There is religious. Right. Which a lot of the liberal media believe represents all conservative views. But there is none that really talks about patriotism or self-reliance or some of the, what I consider the, the fundamental values of conservatism in this country. And so you're really fighting against an established industry that does not want to change. Um, that is also stretching for money. Um, almost all the media companies are struggling right now. So the best thing you can do is find an editor who is um, compatible with your views. I, I have, I edit in fact too, and I have clients coming to me saying, I don't trust the editors um, to not slash out my references to Jesus or something like that. They are very, very sensitive to that. So you have to find someone who's compatible and then be willing to take on the ownership of selling your own book. Um, no one's going to do it for you. And that's true if you went to a publishing house too, by the way, unless you're Hillary Clinton or, you know, uh, Harmeet Dillon, maybe probably these days could probably get a book book deal. They don't, people don't know who you are. And so you have to just develop your own brand, your own voice and your relevancy. Um, I think a lot of people forget that y you have to make your work relevant to people's lives today. Excellent. Well, you've done just that. That's some great advice, by the way, and I appreciate that. Before we let mm -hmm. you go, Anne, anything you can share about work, something you're working on right now, something that's maybe come in early 2020, projects you've got in the hopper? Um, I have been doing quite a bit with the mining industry, uh, amusingly, um, and I realized that my books actually all have that theme, so I've kind of embraced that path for a while. Uh, it's a broken industry and it needs some people writing about it and talking about it from a positive point of view. I've been doing more with short stories. I think I'm going to release a short story that um, was actually published in a small online magazine uh, last year, but I'm going to do it with a compendium on, on critical thinking, how you can really take a look at what the uh, news media and and uh, I guess the printed word and how to learn how to look at the words and the stories and try to find where there are hidden clues that should alert you to the fact that something is wrong with this picture. Interesting. All right. Well, I look forward to that. Now, uh, you can find links to a lot of Anne's work at the show notes page at hollywoodintoto.com, or you can go to your favorite search engine and punch in Silicon Valley author Anne Bridges, and you'll find all about Anne. Thanks, Anne, for joining the show, and uh, we will check in with you down the road. Thank you very much, Christian. I really enjoyed it. Don't touch that dial. You're listening to my daddy's podcast. John Rivley and I go way back to our days at FIT. That's the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. Back then, I really wanted to be an illustrator. And John was the most engaging guy in class. So we became friends, laughed at all the art school hijinks, and there was a lot of them. And then something else happened. John took some art classes overseas for a semester. He came back a changed man. I mean, he looked the same, sounded the same, still a funny guy. But John Rivoli 2.0 is suddenly so far ahead of my skill set, I realized on some level I was in the wrong line of work. But John wasn't. He was right where he needed to be. I left school and became a writer. John kept pursuing art and became the founder of Rivoli Design Group. He then embraced Hollywood in a much different way than I have. He started creating merchandising art for the biggest film franchises around, Think Rocky, The Lord of the Rings, SpongeBob SquarePants, you name it. These days, he's actually branched off in a fresh direction in addition to all his existing work. His website, iconsinart.com, showcases his amazing artwork, which you can add to your own home collection. 
punch in TOTO10 into the promo code space on his website for a 10% discount. John and I haven't talked or emailed or even communicated at all since we left FIT. Sometimes that happens with college friends. You just drift apart. But recently, I reunited with John after a really curious situation. I was going through my Instagram feed, and I follow Sylvester Stallone on the social media site. And Sly shared an illustration that someone did of him that I thought was amazing. Wow. This was the kind of work that I dreamed of being able to do years ago. I just couldn't hack it, and I moved on from there. Now, Stallone happened to tag the author, the, I'm sorry, the artist, in this particular post. And the name looked familiar. Wait, is that John Rivley from FIT? Yep, the one and only. So we reconnected on social media, and naturally, I wanted to invite him on the show, specifically because I heard of the cool work he's doing in art that connects directly to Hollywood. Now, in the following conversation, we talk about his journey, how he helps bring out the best in movie franchises through his art, and what it's like to meet and create artwork with Sylvester Stallone. Now, I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation, but I have to say, not as much as I did. Please welcome John Rivoli to the Headcast. Well, John, I wanted to start off with a little bit of our collective background. You and I came of age at a time where technology really wasn't at the forefront. The digital age was just creeping up on us. And I remember it being in class and asking a teacher saying, hey, aren't we going to be doing this on computers in five years? And he said, oh, no, that's, that's way off. That's not going to happen. Of course, he was wrong, and now I'm not even in the art realm. From your perspective, <laughs> did you see other artists struggle with that shift? And how did you kind of embrace it head on? Yeah, uh, and, and you're right about that. I remember uh, in school, they didn't even have computers no. uh, when we were there. Everything was was by hand. And um, timing-wise, when I got out and started working in in the art field, it was still by hand. So it was, it was okay, but not for long. And uh, I remember I was actually working for Warner Brothers uh, uh, licensee doing all their T-shirts. And we would do everything by hand. We would draw it and color it in with markers and everything else. And there was a whole staff of us. It was like 20 of us in a room just doing this. And uh, they were always hiring new people. And one day they hired this guy, uh, Dave, Dave Fontaine. And he was doing it by hand, but he was also one of those guys who was right in front of the computer stuff. And I remember him. He talked them into letting him have a computer, which he, he got. They bought some cheapy, you know, homemade kind of one, uh, not even a name brand. And I remember him walking out into the main area where we all were saying, hey, if anybody wants to learn this thing, come in the back. And nobody responded except for me. So I got up. I went in the back room. I, I refer to him as Computer Dave. And I still do to this day. We still work together on wow. every project I do for Rivoli Design Group. He and I work together on. And he taught me the computer and I just sat back there and made that migration from hand to uh, digital. And most everybody else fought it. They just thought this isn't going to last. It isn't going to stay, you know, it can't replace the hand work. And they, you know, they just rejected it. And I looked at it a little differently. I just looked at it as, and I remember this when we were in school, um, that when they introduced the airbrush, remember the airbrush came in okay. and we were like, oh, look at this thing. And you could do all this new stuff. And I looked at the computer as just an, an airbrush. Yeah. I thought, this is just another tool in the toolbox. How can I just meld it with what I'm doing? And then I worked really hard to try to come up with a way to gel those two worlds of the hand and the digital. And that's what I do to this day for all the studios, which is why I continued to get work is that all of my art that I deliver is originated in hand work. And then I bring it into the machine and do all the finishing there. Yeah. And, uh, and all the art training you had did pay off. It just needed that bridge, which is uh, computer Dave to make, make it all possible. Yeah. And you know, listen, um, you can't, uh, the funny thing is I see these other artists today who only started in the digital world and they lack all those fundamental skills that guys like mm -hmm. us learned yeah. the figure yeah. drawing the anatomy all that stuff it means everything and you know what if the power goes out we can still keep working <laughs> you know 
but they can't. But but to bring that knowledge of the of the classical training to the computer gives you a certain edge. Interesting. Now it sounds like you got involved with Hollywood merchandise art pretty early on. Was that an organic switch, or was there sort of a happenstance that that made that happen? Talk about that that leap. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I always wanted to draw cartoon characters like Bugs Bunny and stuff as as a young kid growing up. I always wanted to do that. I didn't know how that was going to happen. And, you know, licensing became a big thing uh, around the time, uh, you know, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, where you didn't necessarily only have to work for the movie studio, but there were these other companies that were part of the whole that you could work for and deal with those characters. And, and, you know, I went to a licensee and was able to bring my knowledge of all those Looney Tune characters to them and, you know, produce all of the, uh, all the t-shirt art. Amazing. Now talk, you know, we think about movie marketing, you think the trailer and the poster and the celebrities going out on the, on the publicity tour. Uh, for those who don't know sort of the inner workings of movie mer- merchandise, how does it fit into the, the big picture? No pun intended, maybe pun intended. Yeah. Well, yeah, that everything you said is one aspect of a, of a film and its release and its success. The other part that not many people know about, if they think about it, they'll realize they, they are aware of it, but it's the whole consumer products part of a film. And that is where really all the money is made. Mm-hmm. It's on the back end and it's in all those products. So when you go to Target or Walmart or Hot Topic and you see those T-shirts and those backpacks and, you know, uh, writing tablet, any of that stuff that has Harry Potter on it or Wonder Woman, that's where the studio makes their money. And that's where we came in because somebody has to create that that narrative for them. Mm -hmm. So it's our job to continue the story of the film, the theme of the film that the director was going for. We have to continue that now into products. So we create what are called style guides and it's really just a Bible for the film. And inside of that, we tell you what fonts you can use, what 12 or 14 colors you're allowed to use. And we make the packaging we give you the artwork. Everything is in this book. So whether it comes from Australia or Italy or the U.S., it all is uniformed. And you wonder how that happened. Gee, they, you know, they're doing stuff very similar. No, they're all using the same art from the same book mm-hmm. that somebody like us made for them. Interesting. And I imagine yeah. that your creative freedom may vary depending on the assignment, depending on the franchise. Is, is it all over the map that way? Yeah, there's all different styles, um, depending on the property itself, uh, depending on what's going on trend wise out there, we have to kind of switch gears a lot. It's not like, oh, well, they do this, let's bring them in for it. it we, we have to change all the time uh, to, to fit in, at least if you want to be successful, you know, we don't want to pigeonhole ourselves. So we're always switching gears on on our looks and what we bring to it. Do you have a particular either – I mean I guess we're going to talk about Sylvester Stallone and Rocky soon. Are there any franchises or other brands that have really – you think kind of inspire you, you connect with or that have been the most fun to kind of work on? Um, you know, all of them in their own way are really cool. I mean we did all of the Harry Potter starting from year one, the first film. Uh, and that was really quite you know interesting because um, – you know, we had to work with the filmmakers right from the beginning on establishing what Harry Potter was going to be, you know. So it's always interesting when you can get one that doesn't already have a built in and you kind of have to figure it out what it's what, who our audience might be yeah. and what they might like. That's that's always a fun challenge. And then it's also cool. But to get those. But like when I did Karate Kid and Sony came to me and said, we, we want to do a bunch of art for Karate Kid to commemorate the 30th anniversary. I mean, that's awesome. You know, because it's just one of those things we grew up with and you can't wait to get into it. So, yeah. Now, you, yeah. you mentioned the style guides and sort of the certain templates you need to follow. Is there anything else about your line of work with movie merchandising that would surprise people who haven't really gotten deep into it? I think they would just be surprised to know that, you know, almost all of that art that has been out over the past 20 years, a good percentage 
of the artwork on stuff that you that people may have seen in like Target or something mm-hmm. came from came from us, my group. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. I used to say um, when people wanted to see your portfolio, I would say, "All right, go to Target, go to the toy aisle, just walk." <laughs> There you go. That's all the lot. Like, I think people would be surprised to know that like one group is producing all of that stuff that's yeah. out there. You know, you mentioned um, we kind of talked off air about digital inking and how important that is to your group and, and your success. Can you break that down for people? I, I, I was a little fuzzy on it. And I, I just want to it sounds like an important aspect of what you do. And just maybe for the layman, how would you kind of describe what that process is? Yeah, well, that's one of the big – that was the biggest one of my migration to digital is that, um, y- you know, as far as it goes with characters like Mickey Mouse or Bugs Bunny and those, all those were drawn. Every one of those characters are drawn and inked, you know, with a paintbrush and black ink by hand. And you would scan those into the computer and that was your piece of art. And there was a lot of shortcomings with that. And I was trying to find a way – can I, can I do this by originating it in the computer, but fooling people into thinking I did it by hand? So we were kind of messing around with some of the tools in Adobe, and we, and we found this one tool, and we r- realized that we could actually draw painted lines if you know how to do it by hand. So we know that if we start here and we apply pressure to the – uh, paintbrush, it would get thicker. And then as we let off, it gets thinner. So we call that thick to thin. And I found a way to do that in the computer. So I was able to digitally ink characters. So they originated in the computer, which means they were vector based. Now they're vector based, which means they're not based on resolution. And you could do anything with those characters. You could blow them up and put them on the Empire State Building, and they're going to look perfect. Mm. And the other way, before that, they would break into pieces. You would see them pixelate and bust up. So that was the big claim to fame for us is that we created this digital inking. And that's why I went around to the studios and showed everybody. And we just got all the work. Mm. We got all the work to do it because – and over the past 20 years, I I guarantee you – I don't know, 98% of the character art that you've seen in the world is, is mine. Gotcha. Is mine. No matter what character it is, because we were as doing it. Now everybody kind of does it. They don't do it as well because they never did it by hand. See, the, again, the key was that I used to do it by hand for Disney. So I know what the brush does. And in order to fake it, I have to know how to do it. Yeah. And that's the difference. Yeah. So that, that's the big thing about the digital inking. Uh, in the introduction, I talked about how you and I reconnected and the, the Stallone factor. And I want to talk a little bit about him. Obviously, you can find out a lot of your collaborations at iconsinart.com. But you've met him. You've had, you know, you go back and forth on fleshing out these projects. What can you share about Stallone that maybe his fans wouldn't recognize or know or just you have a certain access to him that we don't? And we've followed him for decades. What, what, what can you share about it? him as, as an artist, as a creator? I would say, I don't know that many people know that he is an amazing painter uh, to keep it in our world here of what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. He's an incredible artist, an abstract artist. And I've seen his work and it is incredibly impressive. Um, Christian, it, you know, he's got this use of color and brush strokes that when you look at it, you know, um, here's a guy with a vision and knows exactly what he's doing. I mean, he attacks that canvas Mm -hmm. and it looks amazing, uh, every time. So he's got, you know, he's got an incredible eye. He has an incredible knowledge of art and artists. And I guess the thing is that I don't know that people know that he paints and is an amazing, amazing painter, which is why he has such strong opinions on what I do. And is able to give me such good feedback. And every time he does, you know, I'll do a painting and I'll send it to him and he'll give me feedback, changes, and I'll do it. And it always makes for a better piece because he, he yeah, he knows what his nose is way around a canvas. Yeah. And I would imagine a lot of celebrities might give feedback that is not informed, that maybe just their ego talking or just they want to kind of throw their weight around. It sounds like he's the opposite. He's really looking for the best of the best and has the kind of the intellectual firepower to bring it to the fore. 
that that you couldn't have said a truer statement. That is exactly it. Because I deal with a lot of celebrities on the on the other, you know, the design end of things, uh-huh. and they, you know, they drive us bonkers sometimes with changes and this and that. And they're really based on almost nothing except for if they had a good cup of coffee that day yeah. and if they're in what kind of mood they're in. So to your point, yeah, when Sly speaks, it it's for a reason that he's giving you this comment. It's for a reason. Yeah, that's what I found out. This is going to sound like a dumb question, but I think we all have a connection to Rocky on some level. It's iconic. It's been part of our lives for 30, 40 years. From your perspective, you can see the passion and the connection that you have to the franchise, to the character. Maybe just elaborate on it, why you have this sort of bond with a character who, you know, listen, we, there's a million things in pop culture we can kind of gravitate toward now, but you're still with this franchise, this character who just seems ageless. Yeah. Um, Rocky, you know, I saw it in the movies in 1976. So we were kids. I was eight years old when that came out. And I saw it in the movie theater 13 times. <laughs> I paid to go see Rocky and that had never happened to me before. But something about that film and particularly, you know, that character just kind of got into me and changed my DNA. That, that That's the best way. I can put it. And I kind of based a lot of myself on that character. And it's really about, you know, Rocky's values um, and his character, his work ethic, his honesty, his humility, you know, Um, the the fact that, you know, all you want to do in life, and we all want this, we all just want one good shot, right? One, one shot at the plate, give us the bat, let us take a swing at this thing. And, and that's really kind of one of the big themes. And, and it, it so resonated with me that this guy was just told he's a bum and nothing his his whole life. And, and he gets this shot and he's going to go for it, but he knows he can't win. He knows he's completely out of his league. So he changes what winning means to him he redefines it and winning to him is just going the distance yeah right hanging in there emptying the tank and going this whole way to prove that you are not a bomb and i may not win but i can hang in there with the best of them and and that's just something that kind of got into me uh, that and other things from that character and i've always live that way. You know, people who know me say, this guy just never stops. I mean, my God, he's coming at you. He keeps coming at you, you know, and, and that I get from Rocky. So I've been fascinated with that character my whole life. Everybody who knows me knows, oh my God, it's just, he's crazy with Rocky. So when I decided to do fine art and to start this new thing, you know, thing, icons and art, it was, it was just so uh, obvious that I was going to go to Rocky first because I have such a passion for it. Uh, you know, your work, you said, is everywhere, and yet people, I don't think, know your name like they may know other artists or certainly not I Stallone. Do you, do you want that to change to a certain degree? I mean, what would, what would sort of more recognition do for your art, or is it sort of a pragmatic choice to maybe even kind of get more people to be at iconsandart.com, that kind of a thing? Yeah, I mean, the, the goal is to now start getting the word out about who I am and and what I've been doing all these years, because we can't tell people, you know, that's part of the agreement with the contracts with the studios. Every time we get a job, we're a secret, you know, because everything appears as if it's coming directly from the studio and the film, it filmmakers themselves. But so we can't go out advertising, Hey, you know, I did all this stuff. Yeah. So, but now, you know, when you cross over and I want to, you know, kind of define myself as a fine artist now and start selling paintings. I need to let people know the history of who I am so they can understand, you know, I, I drew all the SpongeBob art for the first 10 years of that cartoon, everything. Like every time I mention that to people, they kind of stop dead in their tracks. Like, Oh my God, that, that's you. Like, yeah. So uh, yeah, the, I'm trying now to somehow in the, in the, you know, best way I can to let people know who I am as an artist so that icons and art make sense to people. Yeah. Well, when they visit the site, they certainly will make that sense. Before I let you go, John, 
like I mentioned before, I feel like you get a look at Hollywood and the media that we don't get. It's sort of a different perspective. And there are technical aspects of it for sure. But are there any cultural trends you see going on right now that maybe haven't bubbled up? We haven't read any think pieces about the latest blah, blah, blah in the industry that, that you can kind of share? Cultural trends, um, that's, a, that's a big one because there is, you know, nothing is an accident in Hollywood. And nothing that you see in a film or television show is an accident. It's placed there very strategically for a reason. So the creators have something to say or they have an agenda, but there's something that they want to get out there. Um, So, you know, and and I see it all the time and we kind of just have to buy into whatever it is so that we can create for them the best we can. Um, But that's like a totally different thing than – um, do we see what the new trends might be and all that? It, it's kind of even shied away from that. It used to be based on that, um, where what's going to be, you know, what's the big thing coming up in 20 and 2021 that we can tap into? It's, it's, it's tighter now, Chris, it's tighter yeah. where they, they have something to say right now about a subject that's going on right now. It's not about trending anymore. It's real time. It's real time messaging. Yeah. So it's hard to keep up with yeah all right well john i love this insight into a a part of hollywood we don't normally hear about but it's great all the same i appreciate you for joining the hitcast you can find some of john's amazing work at iconsinart.com and if you make a purchase there you can use the promo code toto10 and i'll have links to this in the show notes page and you get a little bit of a discount and of course you can just look around the world go in the department stores go into target and you'll probably see some of john's work there too John, keep up the great work and uh, give our best to slide. I will. Thank you, Christian. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Well, thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out HollywoodandToto.com for both the show notes and, of course, the latest entertainment news. Please follow me at Twitter at Hollywood and Toto. And we'd love it if you leave a podcast review over at iTunes. See you next week.